The Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series began in 2018, and it invites world-renowned faculty and professionals to Purdue Engineering to encourage thought-provoking conversations and ideas with faculty and students regarding grand challenges and opportunities in their fields. And besides presenting a lecture to a broad audience of students and faculty, they engage in an interactive panel, which we'll have right after Dr. Pfeiffer's lecture. Um, several of us had a great opportunity to see his plant, and it really, you're in for a real treat today with his presentation. And to, inter to introduce our speaker, uh, I'm going to call uh, Dean Ramon to the podium, uh, and he's going to, to say a few more words and then turn it right over to Greg. Dean Ramon. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. This is the first uh, in this academic year of our series, Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, and it's my honor, of course, to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Gret Pfeiffer, who is a pioneering entrepreneur and the visionary founder of Shine Technology, uh, which is renowned for its groundbreaking advancements in the field of clean energy and sustainable technology. He holds a PhD in nuclear engineering and BS degrees in physics and electrical and computer engineering from the University of Wisconsin uh, at Madison. His leadership is characterized by a commitment to pushing the boundaries of technology while maintaining a focus on practical real-world applications. Now, uh, the nomination uh, for Dr. Pfeiffer came from the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering in partnership with their School of Nuclear Engineering because of some pretty amazing results uh, that were demonstrated uh, by the company last year. If you haven't been reading the news, uh, the company demonstrated uh, pretty amazing results uh, with respect to deuterium tritium fusion at an intensity that allowed it to be seen in the visible spectrum through Cherenko radiation. So uh, to hear more about this, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pfeiffer to the stage. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for the intro and, and thank you all for coming. This is like kind of an awesome turnout um, and looking forward to sharing a little bit of my story and then, you know, moving on to shine to get into our story as a company. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of you people here, I imagine, are pretty concerned about clean energy and where the planet's going. Um, and I hope that's why a lot of you are here. I hope a lot of you are here, here to learn about fusion and, and how we're going to use it ultimately to not just make clean energy, but to make energy in a way that removes um, energy as a constraint on human growth, frankly. So we've been energy constrained up until now, and I think over the next several decades, we're gonna remove that constraint on human growth. Um, so that, that requires a bit of responsibility with it, um, but I think that's ultimately the promise of fusion. So super exciting to, to be talking to you guys about it. Um, just a per personal story and, and how I got into this. So I was a nerdy kid, I don't know, many, many of you in here may be. Um, and you know, when other kids would go out to recess, I would literally read about um, particle accelerators and, and fusion reactors. Uh, and this goes all the way back to middle school, at least that I can remember. Uh, and pretty, ex pretty early on, like the hook got set on fusion. Uh, and like maybe some of you, uh, I was very into Star Trek and it seemed like one of the keys to getting to, to that world was energy abundance, like massive amounts of very cheap energy. And I learned a fact very early on, which is that fusion fuels possess about 100 million times more energy per kilogram than coal. Right? So if I have one kilogram of fusion fuel, that's got the same energy as 100 million kilograms of coal. That just kind of set the hook. And I was like, this is really cool. I want to play a technology role in this. And I've, I've, always, been, I've always had a knack for science. Right, science and engineering, those are always things that came easy to me. So that's what I wanted to do. So I ended up, long story short, in grad school studying nuclear fusion as a means of producing energy. And I saw my, my place in doing that as being a technology developer, being a scientist or an engineer uh, that would work on fusion. And, and I, I ended up in a fusion engineering program at the University of Wisconsin. So they had a specific program under something called the Fusion Technology Institute. And their mission was, assume we figure out the physics of fusion, how do you make a power plant? Right? How do you make a real working machine that can be scaled uh, and can produce uh, electricity and, and, and proliferate out to the masses and deliver on the promise of fusion? And it was really sad. <laughs> 
Um, I spent several years uh, in that, um, that system, and, and what I pretty quickly realized was that, at least from my perspective, humanity did not yet have the tools to make fusion energy cost competitive, even if we could figure out the physics. So fusion reactors are tremendously complicated. They operate in some of the most harsh environments ever created by humans. Uh, they have some of the most expensive components around them from a raw materials perspective and from a build perspective. Uh, and they have to compete uh, with electricity that is generated um, four or five cents per kilowatt hour. So uh, that kind of made me, made me sad, I guess. <laughs> um, and, and furthermore, fusion was largely supported at the time by governments that had funding cycles. So if you wanted to be a fusion researcher, you'd have money for a while and then you wouldn't have money. And so it was kind of a sad, depressing field actually for, for many generations. But I had an advisor who, who planted a cool seed in my head, which I really liked and I really ran with. Uh, and that seed was, well, maybe there are some things you can do with fusion today that will add value to the world. And maybe by doing that, you can practice it. And by practicing it, you can get better at it. And by getting better at it, you can grow it in time. And, and eventually, over time, uh, move toward fusion energy. But all the while, you're providing real value for the world. So you knew your life was going to be spent doing something important. Right? You knew that you were going to be doing something important. So that's what led to the creation of this company, that simple thesis. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm going to spend uh, the rest of my time talking about. Um, I do want to leave at least 15 minutes for questions, so I've asked the, the team here to remind me when I'm getting close to the end. I, I sometimes get on a roll. Um, so hopefully, you guys, if you have questions, save them. I'm going to leave at least 15 minutes so we can talk about them at the end. So with that, um, I've got a clicker here. Let me go to the next slide. So Shine, what is our mission? Um, our mission is to deploy state-of-the-art fusion technology to solve global problems today. So where can we deploy fusion to add value to the world today as a scalable path to achieving fusion energy over time. And why is fusion interesting outside of the energy regime? Well, it, it produces energy on the one hand, but on the other hand, it produces reaction products like neutrons. So if you look at fusion of deuterium and tritium, you get energy out. Sure, it's an exothermic reaction, but you also get particles out. And some reactions produce different particles, but deuterium and tritium in particular produce neutrons. And it turns out neutrons are valuable. Uh, and so one of the most important things to our business thesis early on was, is that neutron more valuable than the energy? And if so, how do we capture that value? Turns out they're valuable. You need to sell energy for five cents per kilowatt hour to make money in fusion if you're banking energy. If you're selling neutrons, in the most valuable markets, you can sell neutrons for an equivalent of $100,000 per kilowatt hour. It's a really good place to enter the market. It's important. The applications we're going to talk about here serve humanity um, all the way from the interests of national security to aviation security, up through healthcare supply chain, ultimately recycling nuclear waste and then clean energy. Uh, so all of these things we're going to talk about on our phased approach are very important for humans. The path has always been guided by scalability, though. It's important that we don't get too distracted from our long-term mission, which is energy generation. Uh, so what we try to do is pick businesses where there's a clear human need, an important human need, but that applying ourselves and our time to those businesses will move us in the direction of fusion energy. Uh, and then it turns out that fusion can be much lower cost than alternative sources of, of, of neutrons in particular for a lot of these applications. So, so that's kind of what we're focused on from a business standpoint. Right now, our business is characterized by these four phases. And I say right now uh, because anyone who ever starts a business needs to understand that facts on the ground change, assumptions change, and you need to be willing to move your business model around. We're no different. Uh, we're willing to move our business model around if our assumptions are wrong or facts change. Um, this vision's actually held for about the last 20 years, uh, so it's been a reasonable guiding North Star for us. Um, but this is kind of where we're at. So we're going to talk about these four phases. These are major phases of evolution in our company as we go forward. Phase one and two, neutron testing and the production of medical isotopes, uh, are already commercial. Uh, so these are things we're already doing today and scaling in. And phases three and phases four are where we're going. So I'm going to talk about those uh, in a minute. Phase one, OK, where do we get paid $100,000 per kilowatt hour equivalent of neutrons? It's essentially for non-destructive testing. There's two primary applications. 
The first is imaging. So many of you are probably familiar with x-ray based imaging. You've probably all had an x-ray and seen your bones inside your body at some point or other. So x-ray is wonderful when you want to penetrate light materials and, and, and see heavy materials inside of those light materials. Heavy materials, high Z, high on the periodic table, absorb x-ray really well. Neutrons are kind of the opposite, um, with some exceptions. Uh, so neutrons largely scatter more off of light materials, like hydrogen, like carbon, like nitrogen. So if you want to get high resolution imagery of things that are made of plastic or carbon fiber, neutrons are typically more sensitive. So for in imaging, particularly in aviation uh, and some military applications, neutron imaging is essential to ensure that aircraft function properly. And then there's a whole other application area of, of neutrons, particularly fusion neutrons, that are radiation hardness uh, testing. Uh, so one of the most important strategic defense applications for ne neutrons in rad hardness testing is we want to make sure that defense satellites that we put up in space that keep an eye on you know, sort of other countries that would do us harm or keep an eye on incoming missiles if someone would attack us, we want to make sure that those satellites continue to function uh, if there is a nuclear attack. So let's say somebody wants to do something bad to the United States. The first thing they would do today is they would launch a nuclear weapon into space. It would detonate near our satellites and it would take them all out. Either that or the, the only satellites that would survive it are using 30, 40 year old chip technology. Because it turns out older chips are more resistant to radiation. Having an important test platform to develop new chips that can survive that environment is essential. And we have the brightest fusion neutron source by about a factor of 10,000 anywhere in the world. Uh, so we found a nice niche for developing fusion and helping ensure national security there. Uh, we also have a, a really cool systems and manufacturing division that uh, has come out of these businesses where we make our own stuff, right? So we don't, uh, we do a lot of vertical integration. So those of you who are fans of SpaceX, which I assume is probably almost everybody in an engineering school, um, you know, one of the things that they've done marvelously is they vertically integrated into markets that have been really bad at producing things for space, very, in very inefficient, at least, at producing hardware for space. We very quickly realized we needed to do the same thing. If we're going to build these high-tech systems, we need to do it in-house. So we've developed a systems and manufacturing capability. We occasionally use that capability to sell systems externally as well. Uh, and so that's been a, a nice revenue stream for us. So this picture is uh, not useful other than it demonstrates what I was saying about neutron radiography. So on the left-hand side, these are the same. These are the same. OK, so they're a picture of the same thing. Uh, and so you've got a little Lego guy <laughs> inside of this big metal filled, I don't know if it's staples or needles or something. And if you have x-ray, you know, x-ray doesn't, doesn't see the Lego guy at all. It just gets absorbed by the needles. So it's really good at seeing the metal. It's terrible at seeing the plastic. On the right hand side, exact same picture with thermal neutrons. So just proving the point that this works. And then here are some of the actual applications, because we're not actually devoting our time finding Lego guys. Um, that's not really interesting. Uh, so you can see um, these are different valves. You can see the X-ray radiograph on the one side. You can see the neutron radiograph on the other. Fuel injectors, not a particularly relevant market, but another great example where you can see what's going on. Um, the most important application, for example, um, for neutron imaging probably today, or one of the most important applications is modern defense aircraft. So the F-35, for example, has one of the most engines ever developed, uh, advanced engines ever developed. The turbine blades in that engine operate in an ambient environment that's about 20% above the melting point of the blade. That's not good, generally. So what they do to deal with that is they suck cold air in from the front of the engine, and they pump it out through cooling channels uh, in the blade itself. And about 1% of the time when they manufacture these blades, that channel is blocked. If the channel's blocked, the blade melts, the engine imbalances, it destroys itself, right? Most engines have lots of blades, you know? So on average, almost every engine would destroy itself uh, if you couldn't do neutron-based testing. X-ray can't see it, ultrasound can't see it, only neutrons can see it. So every F-35 turbine blade ever made has to be imaged with neutrons. Historically, the only way to do this was with fission reactors. So they had to send their whole production line to typically a 60-year-old research reactor somewhere, image it, send the image back, send the part back, uh, and that was, 
that was all you could do. Um, with this technology, we can do this in our imaging center. We can deploy these imaging centers, by the way, for about 20 million each. Um, it costs about $3 billion to build a new reactor. Right? So massively advantaged technology. This is really essential for continued growth in our defense sector. Um, we're very, very sort of central uh, to the value proposition for these supply chains. And we've got Defense Contract Management Agency and everyone else all over us to make sure this scales uh, really, really well. Um, so that's our imaging center on the left and on the top right. Um, going back to the radiation effects system, so that uses what slow or what we call thermal neutrons. Um, on the fast side of the spectrum, as I mentioned, you know we've got this system that can test uh, radiation effects on electronics, and um, Per the Dean's introduction, uh, this is the brightest fusion neutron source in the world. It generates about 50 trillion uh, fusion reactions every second it operates. Uh, so, and just by comparison, you know, there are others in the fusion arena who I would, you know, I don't want to, they have a lot of work to do, but people typically brag about billions, right? Um, so the, the next brightest sources we see in the world are about 5 billion. So 50 trillion is about 10,000 times brighter. We're able to take components that historically took six months to test and test them in a day. Um, we've had the National Ignition Facility come in and bring parts that they want to use to diagnose their, their big fusion machine. Uh, because, and they damage these parts with radiation from the pulses. Uh, you know, they booked, a, they booked booked a week of time on our machine. I, as a good CEO, I went and welcomed them as a new customer lunchtime the first day, and I said, how are we doing? Can we do any better? And they said, well, we're already done. Like, you broke all our stuff. Um, so, you know, it's a really cool source of fusion neutrons, really useful. Uh, and in particular for this application, you cannot use reactor neutrons. Uh, they are specifically looking for the neutron spectrum produced by a thermonuclear explosion, which is a fusion spectrum. So if someone blows up a nuclear weapon, those are the neutrons you get. They're much higher energy than you get from fission. So it's very important that you do this testing with fusion neutrons. On, the, on sort of the path to fusion energy, we needed to get really good at handling tritium. So tritium is one of the key fuel components for first generation fusion reactors. And I say first generation, not planning anywhere in the talk to talk about subsequent generations. So if somebody else wants to ask about that, feel free to do that at the end. Uh, but first generation fusion reactors will burn deuterium and tritium. That means you need to handle these isotopes really, really effectively. And in particular, it means you need to be able to deliver very pure deuterium and tritium streams to the reactor in controlled ratios. We're doing that. We have to do that for this fusion system to make the brightest system in the world work. Uh, and we've developed a lab. This is one of the areas where I'm really proud of our team. So having this in-house sort of capability to manufacture systems gives us a huge cost advantage. What do I mean by that? Our first tritium system uh, was designed by Savannah, uh, Savannah River National Laboratory. Those guys are great at what they do. Uh, they main tritium for the nuclear stockpile. They make sure that our nuclear weapons are ready to go. Um, but they're a national lab. So they designed a system for us that had an estimated cost of $100 million. We looked at that and we said, well, we, don't, we can't afford that. Um, and so we, we designed our own. We took what we learned from them and designed our own. This lab, which is state of the art, probably processes more tritium uh, in a fusion sort of fashion than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and it's, it was about $5 million. So about 1 20th of, of what the national lab cost was. So really proud of our team for this sort of thing. This is kind of looking down at the operations facility. So inside this bunker here is where we operate that. Fusion neutrons are quite penetrating, so we've got about four foot thick concrete walls around it. It also operates in a pool of water. It turns out water is a really good neutron shield. Um, it doesn't become radioactive, number one. And number two, it's just like, as I mentioned, neutrons bounce a lot off of light materials and water is full of hydrogen. Uh, so it slows them down really well. And the operator station just looks like that, though. It's a few computer screens. So everything is run uh, remotely via computer. And this is where we build it. So this is our systems and manufacturing floor. Um, we build the fusion systems there, uh, but we also um, manufacture a wide range of nuclear technology there. So anything where we kind of go out to the industry and we either see that they're not going to be able to do what we want to do cost effectively or quickly, uh, or um, if we think they're kind of full of BS and, and say they can do it and maybe they can't, uh, we've had to take over a number of projects, engineering projects, and bring them in-house here. So we've developed an awesome team of engineers and builders uh, here who actually build all of these systems in-house. 
just another view. You know, it's kind of warehousey with a big crane inside. It looks nice from the outside. Um, the engineering team is resident with the production team. Uh, so everybody's in the same place. So that's kind of phase one. And that's how we got into this. And um, we knew we could do it right away. I, it was literally like one of those moments where I was at a, I was at a party and I did some math. Like I had this idea. I pulled up my laptop. I did some math. And I was like, we can make money doing this. And we can use that to scale Fusion. But the path had to have steps to me. Because even if you look at, OK, you can get paid $100,000 per kilowatt hour, but you need to get to five cents. Um, that's still a really big leap, right? Like that's a factor of two million reduction. And I didn't know how you'd get from here to there without having other markets that allowed you to continue to scale, would allow you to invest in supply chains, create winners all around for a long period of time. So I set out this course which said, okay, if we can get a material reduction in cost, what's the next market, the next big thing, right? What's right after defense applications? And it turns out to be medical applications. Medical applications required us to get the cost of a neutron down to about $200 per kilowatt hour. Okay, so that's a big reduction, 100,000 down to 200. But hey, we did it. Um, so here we are talking about making medicine. So you can do that. And it turned out that if we could do that, we can now use the neutrons instead of using them just to inspect or image different materials. You can use them to change materials. So neutrons are able to turn one element into another or one isotope into another. Sometimes called alchemy, except transmutation actually works. <laughs> it's a physically viable process. Uh, and for example, we could spend our time turning lead into gold. It would cost us a lot more than the value of the gold. <laughs> right? So we don't spend our time turning lead into gold. But we can turn materials like uranium that we can buy for $6 a gram into isotopes like molybdenum-99, which is a medical product used to image disease in 40 million people a year around the world. And it's worth about $200 million per gram, more than gold. Right? Um, a gram, if you're not calibrated, is about half of one of those sugar packets you dump in your coffee. So if you think about that, that's about half a billion dollars worth of molybdenum-99. We can use it to turn something called ytterbium into lutetium-177, which is worth $1 to $2 billion per gram. It's an essential ingredient uh, for, for cancer therapy. It is the kill agent for over 100 therapies under trial today, and a couple that are already commercial. Uh, so we needed that technological innovation to get there. We did it, and we've commercialized it, and are now scaling in this business. So um, as I mentioned, um, we actually have production facilities for lutetium today, and that's what you're seeing on the left side. These are actual hot cells where we do radiochemistry. So making an isotope involves essentially three steps. We take raw materials, uh, something called ytterbium-176, and we produce that in-house. So um, typically, if you, if you pull ytterbium out of the ground, um, it's about 12.3% enriched in the isotope ytterbium-176. So just that's the natural abundance of that. It needs to be 99.5% enriched if you want to make medicine out of it. Otherwise, you get too many impurities, and those impurities are harmful to the patient. Historically, there's one source of this raw material in the world. It's Russia. So we've got this amazing cancer pipeline of new drugs that are in development, some by our colleagues here in the room, uh, all of which flow through, you know, over a billion dollars in product sales for Novartis and in prostate cancer and neuroendocrine cancers. And it all runs through Russia <laughs> until now. So it just happens that our capabilities with fusion allowed us to advance, uh, develop very advanced and very cost-effective particle beam systems. Those particle beam systems allow us to do what's called electromagnetic separation. So we make a beam of ytterbium particles. We bend it with a magnet. The heavier stuff bends a little bit less than the light stuff, and we separate by mass. We can go from 12.3% enriched to 99.5% enriched in single pass. Um, most efficient, most cost-effective enrichment systems I've ever seen, and I've seen, I think, all of them. Uh, so uh, it's a really cool piece of technology that allows us to make the raw materials needed for isotopes. That's step one. Step two, irradiate. You need to transmute it, so you need neutrons for that. Today, we're using reactor neutrons. Tomorrow, we'll be using neutrons from a facility called the Chrysalis. We've invested about a half a billion dollars in this facility. The Chrysalis facility is our fusion-based neutron source, which will be the heart of our medical isotope facility. It's been in the works for 10 years, about two years away from completion. But today, we're in production using reactor neutrons because 
customers need this stuff today. Final step is, radio, uh, uh, is radioisotope processing, so separating out these radioactive materials from one another. It may sound like basic chemistry, uh, and to some extent it is, but the rule book is thrown out. Um, in chemistry, you have these things called activation barriers, where if it's not energetically favorable, it doesn't really happen, unless you put a catalyst or something. Even if it's energetically favorable, if you can't get over the activation barrier, no reaction. In radiochemistry, you've added radiation, which is a source of energy, and now everything can happen. Right, so the question is, will it or not? And that just is more probabilistic. So throughout the rule book, that's an area where we're really distinguished. So I think if you think about Shine and what we are today, we are a fusion company first and foremost, and second, a radiochemistry company. Those are the things we do really well. So we do all of that in-house. We're the only vertically integrated producer of isotopes in the world. Everyone else needs Russia, 60-year-old reactor, and then they do radioisotope separation on their own. Uh, so what you see on the left is the lutetium facility. We're already producing this. We're in humans. We're treating cancer today with this isotope. Uh, and on the right, you see the chrysalis, which is under construction, uh, that, that advanced large-scale production facility. Chrysalis, when done, will be the largest isotope production facility in the world. It'll produce 20 million doses per year. We expect it to be able to produce medicine for at least 50 years. So think about it as a billion-dose facility over its lifetime. That's pretty cool to be able to say you built something that will improve hopefully a billion lives over time. To give you an idea how these products work in the body, um, this is a very famous picture, uh, and it's showing someone with deeply metastatic prostate cancer. So most of the black spots in this person's body are tumors. And so this, is, this is not a person who has cancer in a single organ. This is a person who's late stage. Cancer is spread throughout their entire body. They're really smart people, again, some of whom are in this room, that are developing drugs that target not just the primary cancer site, but target all the metastases. So the drugs stick to the metastases. What we do, what we make, is the kill agent. So lutetium gives off a very short-range radiation. Think of it as traveling less than a millimeter, typically in human tissue. You bind that to the drug with a linker, you inject the drug, the drug finds disease throughout the body, and then this kill agent just sits there with very short range. It's like a smart bomb, right? You've got, uh, you've got bad guys next to a school, right? That's the body. You've got a lot of really healthy tissue you need to protect, but you've got cancer, which basically wants to kill you. It wants to hurt everyone. These drugs root it out. You drop the smart bomb on. The school's fine, right? You don't get a lot of collateral dose, and generally the patient does really well. And what you see here is someone who's actually had only two cycles of PSMA-based cancer. So PSMA is the is the targeting ligand in this case. And you can see the cancer clear up is typically a six cycle course. It's not uncommon to have cancer completely di disappear, at least from imaging, uh, with these products. So, and we're just at the very beginning of this, this story. Like I said, there's two drugs in the market. There's over 100 in clinical trials. Uh, and frankly, there's a lot of other traffic around which isotopes are going to be best. There's a lot of optimization to do yet. And it's a really, really exciting field, frankly. Uh, yeah, so this is more, a little bit more pictures of that Cassiopeia facility I mentioned. Our lutetium, all of our stuff is branded. I'm a, I'm a bit of a closet marketing guy, uh, so I make sure everything, I try to make sure everything looks good. Uh, Illumera is the, the, the name of our lutetium 177 based product. And we actually are operating the largest lutetium processing facility in North America today. Uh, right in, it's actually like in a cornfield in Janesville. Right, so it's pretty, you guys are used to cornfields, um, but nobody would know it's there. On the diagnostic side, um, I mentioned uh, molybdenum-99 earlier. I said it's worth $200 million a uh, dollars a gram, but I also said it's used in 40 million tests a year around the world, uh, and primarily to diagnose heart disease and stage cancer. It's actually a daughter product of moly-99. It decays into technetium-99M, and that's actually the image agent. And you can see here, it's used, you use a special camera called a gamma camera, and it allows you to see things like how far cancer is advanced in the body. It also allows you to see things uh, like um, blood flow in the heart. So uh, personal story, my own dad um, has gone through this where he's had chest pains, he's gone to the hospital, uh, and, and there have been shortages of this isotope frequently because we get all of the isotope from, in the US typically comes from Europe, South Africa, or Australia. Uh, and a lot of times, those shipments don't get here. When they do get here, you lose about a third of it. So these materials decay rapidly. It's like, it's like shipping ice on a hot day, but you have no refrigeration. We have no way of slowing down 
radioactive decay, at least not yet. Uh, so these products are always being lost. So due to shortages, a lot of doctors have switched away from technetium-based imaging to things like ultrasound. So my dad had chest pains. My mom took him to the hospital. They were quite worried about it. He had a history of heart disease, and they gave him an ultrasound scan. The doctor said, nah, go on your ski, ski trip. You're fine. He didn't feel right, so they didn't. About a week later, he's rushed back to the hospital having a heart attack. They got him to the hospital. They did invasive imaging and found a 99% blockage in, in what's called the LAD or the, the widowmaker artery in the heart, right? So this is a really important tool for doctors to have. It allows them to see blood flow in the heart in a very compelling way, and it's very, very cost effective. The supply chain sucks. Uh, it's not as bad as lutetium, where it all starts with Russia, but it does all pass through overseas 60-year-old reactors, and, and those reactors... I drove an old Saturn for a long time. I was fixing it a lot. Um, reactors are a lot like that. They go down unexpectedly and create shortages of these products. So we're going to solve that problem with Chrysalis. I mentioned this building. Uh, it, this is an isotope production platform. It's a giant neutron source is the way to think about it. We're going to produce things like Molly 99, Lutetium-177. But if any of you are nuclear engineers or nuclear physicists, there's a thing called the table of nuclides, which is like the nuclear engineer's periodic table. It starts at the bottom left and goes to the top right, and there's a band of stability that goes all the way up. Those are the naturally occurring isotopes. Everything on the bottom, for more or less, is made with neutrons. More or less, everything made on the top is made with protons. So we make all the stuff in this building that's on the bottom. Right? That's the stuff we're going to be really good at. Uh, so that's the building. Um, by the way, does anyone want to well, hazard a guess as to why it's called the chrysalis? It doesn't make any sense to anyone but me, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah? Oh, that's interesting. Produces all the necessary elements you need for growth. I like that. More, though, uh, it's a place of transformation. Uh, so we take uh, in the front door materials that were once intended to harm humans. So I mentioned uranium is, is something we can turn into molybdenum-99, or we can turn ytterbium into, into lutetium. So it's a place of transformation, which the chrysalis is. It's also a nuclear facility. Chrysalis in nature is impermeable, <laughs> right? It's a very strong facility, and this facility is no different. It's actually designed to withstand plane crashes and earthquakes and everything you could possibly throw at it. Uh, so those are kind of the reasons. But one of the stories that I really used to like to tell is the raw material, the uranium, that we use to drive the isotope production process for moly, xenon, iodine, the first three isotopes and probably many more up there, was once a part of nuclear weapons. So... I don't know if you guys know the history of the Cold War, uh, but the United States and Russia went nuts. Um, we each designed a lot of bombs, like over 100,000 nuclear weapons. That's crazy. Um, nobody ever needed that much. And so now they want to get rid of all this uranium, right? We spent all this money, all this, like, literally 10% of the United States' electricity demand was going to Oak Ridge, Tennessee to enrich uranium at one point. And now they want to get rid of this stuff. Um, so what we do is we take a portion of that and we run it through chrysalis and we turn it into medicine. So, so something that was intended to kill billions of people can now heal up to a billion people. It's one of my favorite parts of the story. So here's just a few more shots. It is the first um, 10 CFR Part 50 nuclear licensed facility with new technology, I think made built by anybody in the United States in recent years. I think it's the only one licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission since they were the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, except for power plants that have been built by giant utilities. Uh, it's, it's like been, this has been like 12 years in the making. We started the regulatory prep work in 2011, submitted the first permitting documents in 2013. Okay, so that's phase two, that's medicine. That's where we are today. So producing, scaling, growing. Where are we going next? Are we going to energy? We're not quite ready for fusion energy yet. We need some practice with fusion energy-like systems. So far, the fusion systems we're using are simpler than a tokamak or simpler than a stellarator. Um, so we need to start practicing with those type of systems. But we want to practice in a way where we can provide value and we can build supply chains and we can build practice. So this is a theme, right? We're just building into this over time. So the next phase for us is to recycle nuclear waste. Okay, so this guy's all over the map. Like, he wants to do defense. He wants to make healthcare products. He wants to recycle nuclear waste. Trust me, all of this is a linear path through technology. If I could characterize the technology development in one simple way, all we're doing is making the target hotter at each phase. Our targets were room temperature for phase one. 
Our targets were tens of thousands of degrees for phase two. For phase three, we'll get close to a million degrees. For phase four, we'll get to sort of the 10 plus million degrees where you need to be thermonuclear, where you need fusion energy. And as you do that, the confinement systems get more complex. Uh, but we're scaling with our suppliers, with our vendors. We're providing our investors a return on investment, right? So all of this is sustainable. It's a decades-long business plan that relies on sustainability. So how the heck does recycling relate to making medicine or anything else? So they mentioned we take uranium into the chrysalis and we turn it into things like Molly 99. The steps in a recycling nuclear waste process look like this. You bring uranium in the front door, you dissolve it. Well, let me start with chrysalis. We bring uranium in the front door, we dissolve it, we hit it with fusion neutrons. We then separate out valuable materials and we recycle uranium and plutonium back into the system and use it again. And we just run that closed loop. What we're going to do in a recycling facility is we're going to bring in spent fuel, which is mostly uranium and plutonium, in the front door. We're going to separate out valuable materials, the first of which is uranium and plutonium. Those should be recycled and put back in reactors. That's 95% of all nuclear waste by volume. That's an, that's an abundant energy source. We can make nuclear renewable just with that chemical step. Then we're going to separate out further commercially viable isotopes and sell them. And finally, we're going to separate out the long-lived waste products that have no disposal path. So one of the biggest criticisms, at least politically, of nuclear energy is that it produces waste that you can't dispose of. Some of it lasts for millions of years. True statement. But you can deal with that. So iodine-129, for example, is a waste product from fission reactors. It has a half-life of greater than 10 million years. How do you prove something is safe for more than 10 million years? You can't. Even Yucca Mountain, right, this great repository they wanted to build for nuclear waste, we don't know what it's going to look like in 10 million years. The entire span of recorded history is thousands of years, right? So it's impossible to imagine. But if you take that isotope and you hit it with fusion neutrons, it becomes iodine-128. Iodine-128 is a half-life of 25 minutes. If you hold it for a day, it's stable. It's gone. Gone as a threat. In general, fusion neutrons can undo the fission capture process. So fission reactors operate largely on a thermal spectrum. The biggest problem are what are called transuranic isotopes. These result from isotopes capturing neutrons and moving into this unstable area. Fusion takes a step back. The energy of the fusion neutrons is such that fast enough that it's one neutron in typically knocks two neutrons out. So it's undoing that capture process. And you can move things back in the chain either to where they're useful like plutonium-239, which should be recycled, or until they're natural, right? They're natural isotopes that are already abundant. So that is where we're going next with fusion. It turns out those systems have sophisticated magnetic confinement type technologies and will give us a lot of practice with fusion power plant-like facilities. And we're going to build a lot of them, probably going to build a dozen or more of these around the world to solve this problem, right, to really solve the waste problem. So I think we'll be best positioned to operate have that operating experience, have that production experience, because not just building machines, these are projects, <laughs> right? Building these sorts of things take time, they take practice, they take really good teams that are integrated across all disciplines of engineering. We're actually not like physicists at Shine. We're engineers. We're a multidisciplinary engineering team, and that's what you need to get this done. So we will get a lot of practice with fusion, and we've already had a lot of practice with radiochemistry because of our isotope work. Uh, so that's where we're going. I kind of talked through these things already. Uh, and it's our hope. By the way, you need to get down to about a dollar per kilowatt hour cost to make recycling look really good. Well, now you're within a factor of 20 of where you need for energy. Maybe energy costs go up a little more. Maybe there's a little subsidy to tip you into profitable. Factor of 10 to 20. You can imagine that with practice. You can imagine supply chain scaling that way. That makes sense. You build a lot of these, you run them, you make them simpler. I don't know if any of you guys have, like follow the SpaceX engine design on their, their engine um, thrust. They started very complicated, and now they're much simpler. Right? You learn a lot, you tighten it up. You get to market, you practice, you tighten it up, you make it better. You can get a factory of tunnel practice. Uh, and so my belief is that by following this pathway, we'll eventually end up uh, being the most successful company in deploying fusion technology in the world. There's a lot of companies doing really cool research into fusion. There's a lot of companies that are trying to hack the code and make fusion easy. I hope to God they succeed. 
But I think ultimately this will be the fastest way to make fusion economical. And if you want it to scale and you want it to change the world, uh, I think this is probably the fastest path uh, for doing it. So that's kind of us. Um, I do think, by the way, I, I don't want to be like some people say, oh, you're, you're cynical in fusion. Not true. <laughs> I believe it is the way humans will make energy. It is absolutely the way we're going to go at some point. I would not bet our carbon emitting future on fusion today. I think we need to invest in lots of solutions. I think fission is a great solution for today that we know works. I think fusion may be part of the solution, but it's not like human energy needs suddenly going to go away in 2050. Right? If fusion's still coming at that time, it's still going to come. And it's important work isn't just going to be about carbon. Like I mentioned, it's going to be about removing energy as a constraint on human growth, on the sort of things we can do. We want to travel to the stars? You need fusion. You want to colonize other planets? You probably need fusion. If you want to do super energy intensive things here on Earth without destroying the planet, you're going to need fusion. So we're going that way. We're absolutely going that way. Uh, and I think, like I said, we have one approach. This is our approach. It's a very commercial and, and practice driven approach. Uh, Cherenkov radiation was mentioned. This is a cool thing. Um, I, if those of you who have seen nuclear reactors know that if you look down at the reactor core when it's on, uh, there's a, a blue, eerie blue glow uh, that comes off the reactor core. Um, we did that with fusion, and we didn't actually expect it to happen. And if there's nuclear engineers in here, they might wonder why this happens. We think we know why this happens. <laughs> um, but what it was really clearly an example to me was the fact that you could see Cherenkov radiation around a fusion system was just very visceral proof that fusion is now on par with some, what some reactors can do. So historical things like defense missions of imaging, producing isotopes, um, these were all the domain of fission reactors in the past. Ultimately, it's our goal to replace fission reactors as a source of energy. Um, so we're on that path. Uh, and this is a really, really cool uh, example um, of this. That's about 150 watts of fusion power, by the way. Not a lot. Uh, but when you can sell it for $100,000 a kilowatt hour, it's actually pretty good. <laughs> Uh, we did set the world record for steady state fusion in 2019. Um, so in terms of a machine that can continuously operate and not operate in a pulse mode, uh, we, we own that. That is our record. We actually may make a run later this year at setting the overall record for total fusion in a single run by humans in any, any controlled fashion ever. Um, that's not my top priority right now. My top priority is our customers. Uh, but if we get a window in there of about a week <laughs> when we can just run, that's going to take us several days. So we want to beat JET. So JET currently has the world record for fusion output in a single pulse. If we run for like four days, I think it is, we'll have more output, more fusion output in a single run. Now, granted, they did it in a shorter period of time. But that's what we do, right? We've brought engineering solutions that allow us to run systems in commercially viable ways. And I would like to own that record, too. Uh, if, you wanted, if you don't want to take my word for this, um, there was a really nice article, a feature article in Science. Um, it was published actually just like a month ago, I think. Time flies. It might be two months. Um, but uh, you can see my mug on the cover. Um, but uh, if you just search my name and, 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 and Science, it'll come up. Um, probably lots of other ways to find it. But it's a cool article. The guy took about a year to write it. Um, he did a really nice job. Got a lot of independent references and sources. So you can kind of read about our, our strategy there. He says that I might run into problems if we take the company public and short-term investors versus long-term. He's not wrong. Um, it's possible. Uh, but then I just wanted to paint a snapshot of kind of our company, where we are today, and where we're going. So you know, right around now, we're at about 270 employees. We've invested about $800 million so far. We expect about $50 million in revenue next year. Um, our non-destructive testing business is operational and growing rapidly. Our medical isotopes business scaling as well. Uh, and then we're planning underway for the recycling facility. So we've designed a conceptual plant and are looking at the regulatory framework. We've had first few meetings with the NRC about it. I expect in about three years, we'll be at about 500 employees. We'll have about a billion dollars in the ground. We should have about 300 million in revenue. So you can see a, a very nice growth case here. Uh, and it's important to have that set of financial returns in order to get continued investment into these growth, growth theses. Uh, and we'll actually be the world's most important producer of isotopes, probably the largest uh, by then. Uh, and we expect to be you know, advancing along phase three. So a little bit about Shine, a little bit about me. I think I'm going to stop there. I think I'm right about where I wanted to be uh, for asking questions and, and open it up.
So let me know what you want to hear. <clears throat> Questions? Yes. Uh, you said that you're going to set the world record. Uh, are you somehow collaborating with either of the friends or just having the, just taking their experience more of their scientists or anything? Yeah, so are we collaborating with either? Um, we, not really. I mean, we know them. They're, they're very much in a project execution mode right now, so they've got a pretty detailed design that they're tracking to. Um, we're more collaborating with, I think, next generation fusion developers. So where people need us is they need the neutrons. Um, one of the biggest challenges with fusion reactors um, is ma our materials. There are no materials that exist that can make a fusion reactor work today, frankly. Um, and, and that's all the way from breeding blankets for tritium to diverters to super high uh, temperature facing components. Uh, and one of the things that they need are fusion neutrons. Um, they need a really bright source of fusion neutrons to validate that materials will work in the radiation environment. So we're doing a lot of that for people. We're also doing collaborations on the physics development of the concepts we like the most for phase three. Uh, so phase three, as I mentioned, can use somewhat simpler confinement systems. Uh, so there's a number of companies we're working with on that front, some in Wisconsin, some other, uh, you know, in other places. Turns out Wisconsin's kind of a hotbed of activity for fusion. Um, who'd have known it? But it's like three companies that are fusion-based um, in, in the Madison area. Yeah. I guess they're bringing you a microphone. <laughs> Okay, very nice talk. I have a question about you. Said, you said you will get this fusion energy running for days, right? Uh, I also have some technical question yeah. about the, what is the superconductor you used for this reaction, for this? Yeah, so we have no superconductors in our fusion system so far. Um, phase three, we will, probably. Um, so we use conventional magnets, that's good enough for phase two. So as I mentioned, one of the advantages of being lower temperature is simpler system. And it needs to be simpler to be commercialized. That's my view today. Uh, so no superconductors today, superconductors for the next phase. Then what's the temperature for this plasma? You know, it's tens of thousands of degrees. Inside. Yeah, so it's an interaction between a particle beam, which is like multi-billion dollar degree equivalent, or de yeah, degree equivalent. I say that because it's not a thermal distribution, but the particle beam is 320 keV. So if you've seen things like plasma temperatures of 10 keV in thermal systems, we're 320 keV, so much hotter than you would find in a fusion reactor. But the containment, the target is only tens of thousands of degrees. So that's, a, that's basically a beam interacting with either, you could call it a cold plasma or a gas. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Oh. Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to find the name of the company, but I couldn't find it. But I heard from some, there are some uh, startups building in the space of like, they're trying to scale down a nuclear reactor and then putting it, they can ship oh. it, put it in a truck and ship it into like disaster zones. What's your opinion on those? Yeah, so small modular reactors have always been an interesting approach. I, I, I mean, I think, look, the, fission, the area of fission needs innovators in general. So I'm super supportive of everything that's going on there. Generally, the challenge, so that the upside of that was the hope that you could do everything in a factory and then you could go to a site and drop that in the ground and you wouldn't have to do a lot of site-specific engineering or development. That's TBD. I, I think whether or not that passes muster, you know, under the regulatory framework we have, I don't know. If it does, cool. If it doesn't, the economy of scale doesn't look great. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of where that is. The problem with these sort of investments, particularly in nuclear, is time. Um, and, and everybody has really ambitious plans, and I'm one of them. Um, you know, we've been slower than I've wanted to be, for sure. Uh, and, and so, Investors kind of lose their patience, and I think that's a, that's a challenge. It's a headwind these companies are going to run into. That said, people are terrified of climate change, and rightfully so. Uh, and fission provides a solution to that. So that kind of breathes life, I think, into some of these longer projects. Honestly, if I were really devoted to fission, I would probably focus on first principles. I would just attack a conventional reactor and try to deliver that without a lot of new technology. And I would just focus on a first principles-based approach to safety, licensing, quality, et cetera, and instead of using the conventional system. And, and I'm going to refer to SpaceX again here because this is something they did masterfully. There was no earth-shattering technology at all that made SpaceX cost 10% of what it cost 
other companies to put things in space. What they did was start and from the beginning and question everything. And where things made sense, they took best practices. And where things didn't, they started over. They threw them away. We need to do that in the nuclear industry. There is a five decades of, I don't want to be kind here, a belief in a certain way of doing things. And, and, it, and humans are fundamentally, we are all simple creatures. So the nuclear industry has largely been supported by cost plus type contract arrangements for a very long period of time. And your incentive in those sort of arrangements is to cost more. Uh, and, and it doesn't happen over a period of a year or two, but over decades you build very inefficient organizations. And you, you use the regulator and you use good quality to drive cost up because you get paid more. We're all just mice looking for the cheese. Um, and, and that's exactly what's happened. So now you have a bunch of industries that are very bad at what they do. They operate under a series of working assumptions that what they're doing is required when those things are not required. They focus on everything instead of focusing on what matters. Uh, and that, by the way, is less safe and lower quality um, in my experience, because if you, don't focus on what, if you don't focus on something, you're not focused on anything. Like if you, you say you're focusing on everything, you're not focused on anything. Uh, so I think first principles thinking is the most important thing to make the nuclear industry work. That can work with small modular reactors, but I would argue that it can work with any reactor design, frankly. Yeah. How was your experience and process of securing investors and what strategies did you use? Yeah, so the question was, how was your experience in securing investors and what process did you use? Uh, it's been all over the place <laughs> over the last, you know, 10 plus years. Um, we have... Now, I'm lucky to claim, you know, some of the best investors in the world, you know, Fidelity, Bailey Gifford amongst our supporters. Um, but in the early days, it was tough. You know, you, you go to people and you say, I want to build a business that's at the nexus of nuclear and healthcare regulation. Right? People are like, uh... <laughs> um, so, you know, our early supporters were all, I'd say, a company, high net worth people that wanted to make more money, but also wanted to, to contribute to, to a better future. So that was a lot of our early supporters. My first, my Series A investor wrote a $10 million check because he was like, okay, well, this is a great business plan and this is going to help people. Um, so it's kind of been all over the map. We've used investment bankers. We haven't used investment bankers. I'd say we've been more successful where we haven't historically, um, where we can directly interface with the investors because it's a complicated story to tell. And investment bankers tend to be very transactional, uh, you know, so they're not really understanding the deep roots of what we're trying to do. Um, and you just meet a lot of people and you tell your story a lot of times and you get a lot of no's and you just keep going. Um, We've, we've been able to raise, you know, about 900 million, 850, 900 million so far. So, you know, we're doing something right. Um, but it's not been an easy path. These, these really high tech, long cycle investments are, are challenging. It's a lot easier to invest in a software company, right? Low CapEx, quick flip. That's what most people want to do. challenges you found starting shine and kind of growing this technology yeah so i would have never thought this when i started because i was a phd nuclear engineer and this is not what i thought it was about <laughs> yeah. uh people it's all people and people say you, you hear that but what does that mean it's all about the humans like you cannot scale this on your own right i can't build an nrc compliant nuclear facility i'd be like or in a bucket of concrete and get some rebar in there, right? So you scale and you build teams. And the biggest mistakes I've made in the company are hiring the wrong people. Uh, and then further exacerbating those mistakes in early years by not fixing things after you have. Like we're, we tend to be nice people in general and you wanna make it work when you've made a mistake. And so we, we almost always have invested too much time trying to turn someone around. The truth is if you're gonna hire fast and you're gonna grow fast, you're gonna make mistakes. And you're going to know you're going to make mistakes and you just got to fix them. Like it's not good for a person to be in a company where they're not adding a lot of value. It's certainly not good for them to be in a company where they're subtracting value. Um, one of the early lessons I learned, um, actually not even that early, it was only a few years ago. I had a guy crystallize it. So life can be reduced to set a series of two by two matrices. <laughs> and, and, and he had this uh, idea that um, if you look at talent on, as a two axis situation where you've got technical ability, um, whether that be management or engineering or whatever on one axis, and you have cultural fit 
on the other. It seems like the most useful people are good cultural fit, high technical ability. Totally agree, everyone's right there. But who are the worst people to have in your company? Well, people tend to, to say it's the, it's the one one, like it's the bad cultural fit, bad technical ability, wrong. <laughs> It is 100% the high technical ability, bad cultural fit, because they're influential. They bring people into their toxic environment and turn them against everything you're trying to do, and they're really good at it. Uh, and so you got to get rid of those people first. Um, there's, you can actually teach people technical ability in a lot of cases. So if you have a great cultural fit and they're you know, teachable, do that. It's actually harder to teach culture. The people that are kind of in the bottom left, you're not really supportive of either, but they're not going to hurt you. It's just kind of dead weight. Um, so those sort of thought processes and the development of the team and being really aggressive about fixing. My hit rate on leaders, on hiring leaders for the company, is no better than 50%. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed by that, but I think it is actually status quo for leadership uh, in companies. And I wish I were better. I like to be better, um, but I, I, I'm, it, I'm not. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it ends up being about finding the right people who really believe in what you're doing, who are really good at what they can do, uh, and who aren't toxic and aren't poisonous to what the company's trying to do, who aren't political, right? They're very team-focused, very focused on the mission. I'll say the other, th other mistakes I've made was, you know, and, and one of the reasons I'm so cynical about the nuclear industry is, is this is an area, I, you know, where I brought in a lot of talent from the nuclear industry, because I'm like, I'm just a kid out of college, right? I'm going to hire people who know how to do this. Well, they brought a lot of that cost plus, you know, um, very inefficient culture with them. And I hated it so much that I immediately responded by hiring all kids right out of school, right? So I'm like, I'm leaving that behind. I'm starting from scratch. Like, um, and there's a problem with that too, because you all come out of here talented, trained, uh, excited, and full of energy, but you don't have confidence yet, right? You haven't built things in the real world. You don't really know how they're going to go. And if you have, you haven't really bet a lot of money on those things, right? So your engineers, you don't want to screw up. Um, so you need mentorship, right? And I've decided for me, for my company, it's about one third more experienced engineers, about two thirds young people that give sort of a magic mix of ability. And the, but these are just things that I learned over years of mistake making, probably the most important ones though. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Oh, microphone. Green shirt. Great, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so you say that you want to recycle the nuclear waste, mm. um, which I believe you'll be the first company in the U.S. to do that. Yeah, so um, nobody has done that in the U.S. Um, yeah. We've done things like it uh, in the weapons complex. Um, in that case, they're trying to separate out plutonium to the point of where it can be purified for bombs. Um, we, uh, the French have done it very successfully. So the French have recycled about 45,000 tons of spent fuel so far. That's about half the U.S. stockpile. So uh, I wanted to ask, yeah, so I was going to say, yeah, the France is already doing it. Um, yeah. And is your process any different uh, from what France is doing? Or uh, if so, may, is it just um, you're adding the step of uh, trying to make the, the actual waste part they can't reuse more stable? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's additive to what France is doing. So the first part of taking the 95%, the uranium and plutonium, and putting it back in reactors, that's what France does already. So the most important part we already know how to do as a society, as a species. And, and we actually have a partnership with Arano, um, who's the company that does all the recycling in France. Um, what we're bringing to the table that we're adding to that is the separation of additional isotopes of economic value from that stream, which is significant. Uh, and then the transmutation of long-lived waste products that are harmful beyond that. So the 5% contains another roughly, I think, 1% to 2% that's these long-lived waste products that you can't dispose of. That's where we're going to apply fusion, um, and that is not something that's happening in France either. Yeah, yeah maybe just pass the mic down. <laughs> okay, so I believe that the public sentiment on the fission energy side of things, it's a huge barrier for additional investments in this nuclear industry. So... How do you think you could overcome that? Well, I think we have. I, you know, I think overcoming the investment thesis requires an investment proposition that makes sense, right? So there's always got to be like an investor just wants to know how much money they're going to make. I mean, they're not all all about that, but fundamentally that's the, the underlying question, right? And so you better have an economic case that you really believe in that you can pitch to them. And 
they're going to check it out, <laughs> right? So, so at the end of the day, um, the phased approach here is driven a bit by reality as well, right? Like, there are companies that are raising money to go straight to fusion energy now, but those investors believe they're going to build some of the most valuable companies in the world, and they believe it's going to be realized in the next decade. So it's all about getting people to believe in what you're trying to sell. You know, for us, it's a bit more grounded in near-term applications, but if you want to raise money in nuclear, you better be ready to show how you're going to create a return on investment. If you're going to raise money for fission, you better be able to show how you're going to be cost disruptive because we just built two plants in Georgia that are going to take 80 years to pay off. And, and nobody in the investment community wants to do that. So you better, better have your answers ready for that. Okay, I think that will be the commercial side of things. So uh, from the public sentiment points to go bigger into the national level or things like that, I think we still have to, to overcome the safety aspects of this technologies and things like that. that yeah, my question is yeah I mean, so, so the, what, the, what society, in my opinion, what society needs to do is look at this for what it is. There is no source of energy generation that's perfect. Nuclear has its issues. You need to remove decay heat or it melts. And if it melts, the fission products come out. Uh, and so you're always going to need some degree of extra safety to prevent that from happening. But on the other hand, we have climate change, right? And this is going to hit the world. It, it already is hitting the world, probably, right, in, in a significant way. So what do we as a society want to bet on? A technology that outside of Chernobyl probably has killed between zero and one people, clearly quantifiable deaths associated with nuclear energy, despite all the public fear, or do you want climate change? Right? And so I think that in the public narrative, this is already happening. Right? People like you, I think, understand this and are, are helping to drive this. Right? You, you're, you don't like climate change. You want to help fix it. Nuclear provides an answer. It's actually not that scary historically. Um, I think government's moving more slowly, um, but they're responsive to the voters. Right? So as public sentiment changes, so will political sentiment, and we're seeing that. So I think you see both Democrats and Republicans very supportive of nuclear energy. Even John Kerry said it at you know, the last climate meeting that, that they were supportive of nuclear energy. Recycling is the next step. You know, I think there's long history of public policy that's anti-recycling. Could talk about that, that's a longer story, but I think that's the next domino to fall. It's people are starting to look at things as a series of trade-offs, which is what life is. And if you wanna find something that's absolutely perfect, Good luck. It doesn't exist. So find the best thing. I think that answers the question. Yeah. So a high hand up in the back there. Yeah. Uh, we live in a time in which we can get almost anything we want in a pretty relatively fast time. And as engineers, we do understand that big improvements and changes take time. Yeah. How do you as a business owner explain to donors, investors, even the government that this is going to take a lot of time? Yeah. Well, you say that, <laughs> and then they say, you know, uh, goodbye, um, come back when you've advanced a little bit further, you know. So, I mean, really, there is a lot of, like, you know, so this isn't the first business I started. So, so I, I kind of had that sense already. So, like, having the stepping stones is a, is a big answer to that question, right? It says, number one, we're pragmatic about how we're going to approach the long amount of time it's going to take. I think that's a good idea. Peter Thiel wrote a book called Zero to One. Um, it talks about developing new technologies, using them to dominate a niche, and then sort of growing by practice through making money. It's a, it's a pretty good book. It's not perfect. Peter Thiel's, you know, he's eccentric. Um, but but it's actually a reasonable thesis. Um, and so that's one way, right? You can, you can show how you're going to grow a business and scale it. Um, you know, if you want to make a, a nuclear, a, a cost disruptive nuclear fission reactor, maybe you find a way to commercialize it on the path for something else, right? Like we're doing. I think that's one of the easiest ways to do it. Other questions? I think we're yeah. at time. Right oh, and we are running out of time. I'm, I'm good, but. <laughs> okay. One more time, and then we'll go to one more question in the panel. Sounds like yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I know you said you're about like 50% on who you hire in your company in terms of leadership. What do you what do you like like to look for when you're hiring people like that? Yeah, so they need to be way smarter than me at whatever it is they do. Um, one of the th this is actually a really good question. So. Um, as a technical guy who became a business person, right? I didn't have an MBA or anything like that, right? Like I kind of learned it all the hard way. Um, it, we're all different and the world is full of talent. And like, 
real value, I think, from people is created in areas where they're like three or four standard deviations off normal, right? So lean into those things. Like for me, that's where I want to spend all my time. I want to get to be five, <laughs> right? Like I want to get to be out on the edge doing what I do that nobody else can do. And I don't want to try and get to be good at those things. I want to hire people who are really good at those things. Uh, so cultural fit, number one, are they going to be part of the team? The team is above everything. Number two, are they that? Are they so much, like, do I learn from them? I do not want to be teaching them. I, I brought in people and I had to teach them too many times. I need them to teach me, right? If I'm bringing in an operator, someone who knows how to scale a business, they need to be so much better at it than me, it's incredible. If I bring in a marketing person, they need to be, so much, they need to be teaching me how to do it, right? And I'm a, I'm a pretty smart guy. I've got a lot of command of a lot of things, but there are people who are much better at a lot of things than I am. So I think that's the thing, is just recognize where you're good, where you're not, lean into where you're good, don't try and be everything, and find people who are amazing in those areas. Okay, I think we're out of time. Awesome. Okay, so now we're gonna have a panel discussion. Anyway, thank you all. This was super fun. <laughs> Thank you.